were a lot closer to the, the states that had the really high tax burdens that lost votes than the other ones. And so if you want to increase the population of the state of Alabama, if you want to increase our potential for economic prosperity, I think the formula is pretty darn clear. Cut government spending, and for the love of all that is good and holy, cut the income tax to zero. Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. So we already know Alabama didn't lose any seats, we just stayed in the holding pattern. So now the question becomes, who did lose seats? Let's look at the census and the results of it. So this particular graph was put up by National Public Radio, NPR. You can see the states there that lost a vote in the House. That's West Virginia, Michigan, New York, California, Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And the states that gained a vote, North Carolina, Florida, Oregon, Colorado, and Montana, and the state that gained two votes, the state of Texas. And this is going to affect the House, this is going to affect the representation in the Electoral College, but let's go ahead and look at this, because I thought this was interesting. I, I wanted to figure out a way to try to explain this, and I'm not saying this is the only factor, but I think this is a significant factor. I did a little research on it, and you'll see there, these are the combined state and average local sales tax rate. So what this is, is it's a, they added up what the state sales tax is, and then combined that with the average sales tax when you're looking at local municipalities. So in Pennsylvania, for example, they would have taken all of the areas and figured out what's the average sales tax in the state and then gone by that. And so you're looking at the sales tax burden in each of these states. So for West Virginia, 6.41, Michigan, 6%, so on and so forth. And you'll notice there's not a lot of distinction in these two graphs. Very little. It's slightly higher on the states that lost a vote, specifically if you're looking at California and Illinois and New York. Those are pretty high, but the thing is, Florida gained a seat. And it's at 7.05, and so that's not too far behind some of the states that lost seats, and it's actually higher than Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Michigan. So, and, and North Carolina is about on par with that. And Texas, which gained two seats, has higher sales tax combined than some of these areas. And so there might be a little bit of correlation, but there's not a lot of distinction. This data, of course, coming from the Tax Foundation. Now, I did a little bit more comparison, and I looked at state top income tax rate. So I just took the top income tax for the state and compared it. Now, here you start seeing some distinction. It's not super definitive. But you look at the states that lost one vote. California, the one that lost the most population, it has a 13.3% top tax rate. New York, a 10.9% top tax rate. That's significantly higher than anything on the states that gained a vote. Even a blue state like Oregon or Colorado has significantly lower income taxes than California and New York. But Illinois, which also lost one, it's got a 4.95, which is by no means outrageous. The big difference, though, and you will notice this, Florida and Texas, the state that gained the most with two on Texas, zero. No income tax whatsoever. So there's some distinction between these two lists. You will notice that there is a trend that the states that lost a vote, in other words, that lost population, those states tended to have significantly higher income tax than the states that didn't. Now, there are some exceptions. For example, Oregon, which is a blue state, but did gain a vote because they did increase in population. It has a 9.9% income tax, where Pennsylvania, which actually lost a vote, has a tax that's only about a third of that, 3.07. So the best thing that I could come up with to try to illustrate a correlation between the two is I added the two charts that we just looked at. So what I did was I combined the tax burden of your average sales tax across the state and your top income tax. And now we start getting a real distinction. So you'll notice on this graph, California, which lost, 
very high tax burden on them, 21.96%. And remember, all of this is completely separate and apart from the tax rate that you pay at the federal level. So this is all extra on top of the federal income tax you already pay, which is, of course, that's uniform across the board when it comes to states. New York with a 19.42, Illinois 14.3. And you don't see any of the states that gained in population have anything close to that. Oregon, which has no sales tax at all, it came up with a a 9.9. So even uber blue leftist Oregon has a little less than half the tax burden of California and New York. And they're the only major blue state. Colorado, it's kind of purplish, but it's been leaning blue recently. But it's got a similar tax burden. It's one of the ones that gained. But it's significantly lower than the average here. So let's look at the averages. The average state that lost a vote has an average tax burden of 1427 the average state that gained a vote, 9.41. That's a significant difference. That's a difference of almost 5%, which would equate to about a third, you know, roughly 33% difference. That is not insignificant, gang. And that does illustrate kind of where we are right now. It shows that there is a desire to move to a place with a lower tax burden. That I'm not saying it's the only factor. Don't get me wrong. It's not the only factor. You've got businesses investing. You've got climate. There's a number of reasons why populations change. But I'm just saying it seems to me virtually impossible that this thing is just a coincidence that you've got states that lost having an average five percentage points higher, just about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's four and like, it's 4.8-ish, something around there. So it's, it's about 5%. You're seeing a 5% difference in the states that gained and the states that lost. That can't be a coincidence. Now, there may be side effects of that tax burden that is part of the reason as well. For example, the states that gained in, pop, uh, in population have significantly better economies and and have more businesses investing in those states, but that's because they have a lower tax burden, or at least that's one of the factors. So I'm not saying that this is a silver bullet. I'm not saying that this would solve all of the problems, but I'm saying we can't ignore a contrast that stark, that it seems to be abundantly clear that states that have lower taxes and lower government spending tend to gain in population. Now, what's really sad in all of this is the underlying message and, and the underlying reality, unfortunately, that what's probably going to happen is a lot of these people that are in blue states like California, like Illinois, which is hemorrhaging population right now, that those people are probably going to migrate to those red states like Florida, like Texas, which has zero income tax, and sadly wind up voting pretty much the same way that they did in the blue states, which will bring about policies and elected officials that bring them right back where they were in the blue states. And that's really sad, but that's the reality. The people in the blue states, Democrat-run states, are so awful at running their own states that they run people off, which then consequently ruin those states as well. It's a horrible thing that is a reality that sadly we just have to deal with. But, you know, I would encourage anybody that flees that tax burden or even flees the lack of jobs or anything else in those other states to sit down and think about why you moved in the first place. Do you really want there to become here when you left there so that you could come here? But I wanted to bring your attention to one more thing on this because we see the averages there. You're seeing the states that lost votes versus the states that increased in population and actually gained votes and the the stark contrast in the averages of their tax burden. Now let's compare that to the state of Alabama. Because I want to take this as a lesson and see what we can learn from that. So let's go ahead and look at our average combined sales tax, just like we did for them. It's 9.22, which is the fourth highest in the country. Let me repeat, fourth highest in the country. Out of 50 states, there are only three that have a larger combined average sales tax rate than the state of Alabama. Now, I know that we often 
talk about Alabama as though it's this uber ruby red state. And to a great degree it is. We have very conservative values. I mean, every freaking political ad that you're going to see from now until election day is going to be talking about how our elected officials teach Bible classes in their spare time. Yes, socially we are incredibly conservative. But the truth is, economically, we're really kind of not. And I don't mean this to bash Alabama. I mean, we do have a lower tax burden in a lot of ways, and, and we do have more moderate government in a lot of ways than a lot of bluer states, but we're not an uber-conservative bastion when it comes to economic policy. The simple fact of the matter is, our politicians really like to tax and really like to spend money. That's what they like to do. They can call themselves Republicans all they want, but we all know that especially in recent years, the state of Alabama was run by Democrats for 138 years, and only recently did we switch over to Republican and, and try to uh, get a hold on conservative economic principles. And because of that, there's a lot of stayover and a lot of Republicans serving right now that used to be Democrats. And so that's part of the issue right there is that they, they may have left the Democrat name behind and they may have even left the Democrat values behind when the Democrats started to change their stances on social issues. But they did not leave behind the economic policies and the way that they thought about policy from when they were Democrats. And so... That's a real problem is that we have the fourth highest combined average sales tax rate in the nation out of the 50 states. Income tax, we're doing a lot better. We've got about 2% to 5%, which is a lot closer to average. We're, I think, below the middle of the pack, but not by a ton. But this gives us a combined average rate of 11.22 to 14.22. Now, if I could call your attention back just a second to the average that we saw there, look at that, guys. We're a lot closer to the states that lost votes than we are to the states that won votes. Their average was 9.41, and our lowest possible, even if you're in the lowest possible tax income bracket, and remember, this is the highest possible income bracket because we took the top income tax from each state. Their highest averages at 9.41. Our lowest starts at 11 and ends almost exactly at the average of the states that lost votes. What does that tell you? That Alabama's tax burden is significantly too much. We're right there in the range. We're about on par with all of the states that lost votes. I don't think it's a coincidence that that took place, and we were also very concerned about losing a vote ourselves. Look, I'm a conservative, and I like Alabama because there are a lot of people here with conservative principles and, and conservative social values. But when it comes to economics, we're a lot closer to those, generally speaking, blue states. The only exception that I can think of off the top of my head, the only red state I saw in that grouping was West Virginia. We're a lot closer to them economically than we are to Texas and Florida and some of the other states that have pretty low tax burdens, Montana, North Carolina, th those kinds of states. We're a lot closer to the, the states that had the really high tax burdens that lost votes than the other ones. And so if you want to increase the population of the state of Alabama, if you want to increase our potential for economic prosperity, I think the formula is pretty darn clear. Cut government spending, and for the love of all that is good and holy, cut the income tax to zero. Or, another thought, we could follow Oregon's model. I know it's weird to hear a conservative say that, but we could even follow Oregon's model. Do the opposite. Have just an income tax and no sales tax at all. Either one of those would be good. What we're doing now is we're taxing people at both ends. We're taxing you when you get paid, and then we tax you when, we sp when you spend the money that we already taxed you on. It's a double tax. And so what we need to do is we need to cut one or the other and keep the other at about the same rate that we have right now. And that would bring us pretty close to Texas and Florida. Remember, even if we just cut out the income tax altogether, we would still have a taxation rate higher than Florida and Texas, but at least it would be somewhere in the ballpark. We would be right around the average of the states that gained. You want to see an economic explosion. You want to see Alabama be an economic powerhouse in this country. That's what you need to do to do it.
Part of the problem, part of the reason that the South, as a general rule, is not, I mean, just exploding with economics even more than they already are, the, the reason that their economies are not doing as well as they could is because Democrats ran their states for over a hundred years too, and they have a lot of those old economic policies in place that the Democrats did, which is largely, not entirely, but largely redistribution of wealth. We have basically all of the resources available to us that Texas and Florida do. We're a significantly smaller state. We, we, you know, we're not as populated as they are, but think about it. We have really good water resources. We have oil resources, not as many as Texas and Florida, but still pretty good oil resources with the Gulf. We have cheap energy. We have abundant resources as far as land goes. We have good cropland. We're basically self-sufficient. We, we could, um, there were only, uh, in a study I saw a few years ago, there were only five or six states in the entire country that but somehow every other state just vanished off the face of the earth that could continue to sustain themselves with the natural resources we have, and Alabama is one of them. And the only difference in us and the economic prosperity that, that we seem to be lacking in a lot of ways versus states surrounding us that seem to be booming like Texas and Florida is that we have an income tax and they don't. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me, I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.